mistake. All right, we're going a little bit of fun this morning. Um, it's nine in the morning, so we will not bog everybody down in technical details. We'll be civilized and we will have a little bit of fun. So, how many of you guys have got a clue as to what the heck we're going to be talking about on this one? No? Good. One, two, three. All right, well, a little bit of fun. All right, so. <sighs> Data leakage, systems beyond our control, setting the scene. The, the whole idea, and we're going to mess around with this one a little bit. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to start off with messing around between Dr. Strangelove, IKA us, and the coyote. Um, we're going to take a look at some of the data leakage, data systems beyond our control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how we get to that data, how we can do what we think we can do. So set the scene a little bit. Data, the amount of data that's beyond our control. Um, and this is the premise for what we are doing and how we are doing or how we're able to do what we're doing. So we're going to take a look at some of the internal data leakages across some of the systems. And yes, we're going to pick on the missile industry and then we're going to pick on the aero industry, just for the fun of it. We're going to take a look. Nickerson hit it on Friday. We're going to take a look at the smaller organizations. In other words, we're not going to pick on the big guys. We're going to pick on their business partners. We're going to pick on the people they do business with. And we're going to pick on their vendors. We're also going to take a look at maybe some of the systems that are beyond their control. So remote workstations, remote configurations. Oh, and how many of you, how many of you guys, I was running with a government company the other week, and they said they're going to start letting users bring their own computers to work. <laughs> I, no shit, so tell me about it. But it seems to be happening. So it's like, okay, we'll have a little bit of fun with that one too. Taking a look at everybody else. So we'll start off. Coyote versus Dr. Strangelove. Why are we looking at this? Attack vectors. What does the coyote use? At this particular one, we're going to concentrate on our friend the coyote and his affiliation with explosives, specifically of the missile type. Coyote's target. Obviously, in this case, we're going after the Roadrunner. Our poor little Coyote, his frontal assault on the Roadrunner, or his frontal attack on the Roadrunner, doesn't really amount to much. The poor little guy can't go fast enough to catch him. The poor little guy, even with his bloody roller skates on, can't go fast enough to catch him either. So he has to look at alternatives. Thankfully for our friendly Coyote, his alternatives are fairly simple. His alternatives, thankfully, is the Acme catalog in all its fine and glory. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to actually, rather than wandering around aimlessly, I'm going to hold this and see if this works. That was cool. I feel like I'm in one of those old flipping B movies. <laughs> so we're going to take, you guys can still hear me when I wander this far away, yeah? All right, good. So we go back a little bit. We have the vector that we're going to attack on. Primarily, the, you know, what are we looking at to use? We're going to have a look at the target. So what target are we looking to acquire? And how are we going to acquire the target? What is our method for acquisition? Thankfully, Acme is good. Acme does not require credit cards. Acme does not have to be PCI compliant, thankfully. Neither does Acme have to worry about ITAR compliance or anything else. Acme is good. You order it, it turns up, you strap it to yourself, and invariably, you call Medicaid afterwards. <laughs> we love Acme. Acme is great. Acme is what everything wants. Acme is like the little box that arrives when we're outside doing a pen test that has the Pony Express in it. It has the pineapple in it. It has the blue. It has everything in one little box. We want this. And by the way, we don't want the invoice that comes with it. <laughs> it's there ready for us. Now, <laughs> I, 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 Andrew, it's so cute. Um, and I'm still traumatized by like Saturday's blind PowerPoint when I had to do on hemorrhoids, for God's sakes. And we ended up talking about hamsters. I, it was not a good thing. So, Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove does not necessarily have the same tools at hand as our friendly coyote. Dr. Strangelove, when he is actually going out and doing a vector assessment, in the case of the movie, obviously it was pretty easy. He went after the Reds and everything else. But the modern version of Dr. Strangelove, us, what do we have to do? Obviously, we have to look at an acquisition engine. What are we doing to look at external vectors? Our acquisition engine, worst case scenario, is Google Foo. 
How do we use the Google Food? What can we do? We have the crawlers, the spiders, the indexes and the engine. You guys can read this just as well as I can. As we are outside of the organization looking at target vectors, how do we find those targets? Do we ask the company? Do we ask on the outside of the company? What kind of B2B companies are they dealing with? Who are their vendors? If I'm looking in this particular case to try and break into maybe, oh, I don't know, an airline organization or somebody that deals with missiles, am I going to go to them directly, knock on the front door and ask for some of it? Hell no. Yep, wrong spider. Now, Strange Love's targets, as we said, used to be the pesky reds, bless their little cotton socks. Now, obviously, we pick on France if we really had to. Unlike Ripper, we don't actually have the keys to the arsenal. We already pointed that one out. We can't just wander down the line, knock on the door, and borrow the missile systems. Not directly. We, they get annoyed when you try and do that. So we have to look at the organizations that are surrounding those. We have to look and say, OK, does Boeing make airplanes? Does somebody make the missile systems? No, they don't. They get a whole bunch of 50 or 100 companies together, and those are the organizations that make the systems themselves. So in this case, we're going after these guys, the L7s, Honeywell, Boeing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do your own research. Boeing, bless their little cotton socks, has got, and we've got, we'll go through this in a second. Boeing's got a really nice website where they actually label who builds the airplane. They've done the intelligence research for you. They've done the target acquisition for you. All you now have to do is figure out how to get to them. The intelligence gathering side of it. Basically, it's a jigsaw. You guys know this if you're on the outside. And if you're not on the outside, if you guys are inside an organization, you need to be thinking about this. Even simple stuff. In our case, the shopping list. This was great. This is like, what do I want to aim for? In the case of what we went after, we figured we'd pick some of the biggest stuff. So we went after the Patriot one. They, and the only reason, actually, we went after the Patriot missile system, I started going after the damn Tomahawk. And I realized they'd mothballed the version I was trying to break into. <laughs> it was a little depressing. I'm like, yeah, I've got into something they mothballed. No good. A squirrel moment for a second. This was kind of fun as well. And we did this. We messed around with stuff on airlines a couple of months ago. I'm like, if I walk away and I shout louder, is this good? This is okay? Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's fine. So we messed around with, with, with guided munitions. And we started looking, and I'll explain how we got to some of this stuff. We started looking at guided munitions. And this is great. They give you a list of components. If you decide you want to build your own guided munition system, you get the list of components. Again, you don't have to go out there. You don't have to break into the organization. It's actually too much hassle in some ways. All you have to do is go out there and do your own blaster research. Now, while you're doing your own research, what we managed to stumble across on the top left-hand side here is the organization that actually provides the high altitude motors. The really nice thing about these guys is their internal database is RW Master. And they have a secondary database is RO Slate. Now, if you work for this company, you might actually want to go back and have some discussions with the um, wonderful DBA Womble that put it up on the damn screen. Because the nice thing about those databases is two of them are publicly accessible. So now, at this point in time, my shopping list consists of a solid state rocket booster for the actual system itself. I now own the code for the solid state rocket booster for the bloody Patriot missile, because some Womble posted it online. Didn't have to break in, didn't have to do anything else. The Womble posted it. And by the way, the top right hand side was provided by our friendly military boys. It's actually the shopping list of what you need to do if you're going to build your own Patriot missile system. Very useful. Unfortunately, again, you can't necessarily go out there and say, hi, can I have a slam ram launcher, please? They get quizzical, they get all upset with you. You have to find a different way of doing it. Now, the fun part of this, this is all public accessible. <laughs> Bubba can get the data too. <laughs> Bottom left hand side, a wonderful example of Bubba. So this is not just me being able to do this. This is stuff you guys can go do your own Google Foo, build your own indexer engine, do what you need to do to be able to pull in this kind of data. 
Now, we're going to pick on Lockheed for a second because, well, we are, just for the fun of it. Top left-hand side was really, really nice. Um, we started doing a little bit of digging on, okay, if I'm going after this particular missile system, where is it? How can I get it? Who owns the contracts for it? Who's got it? And then the nice thing about it is it even, I got a nice little picture to actually figure out what the hell is actually going after. It comes in a neat little package of like three vehicles. Very, very useful. Um, all of this stuff, if you know where and how to look, is all relatively publicly accessible. If you are targeting this organization or you are targeting this specific system, say, you want your own Patriot missile in the back garden. You're your own version of Wiley Coyote. We don't have access to the Acme catalog. We do have the ability to gather data. We've now so far figured out that we can't just go and buy one. They're actually pretty expensive, anywhere from a million to six million a piece. That doesn't include the carrier and all these other bits and pieces. It's just the blasted missile itself, for crying out loud. We can't borrow one. They get all upset if you ask them and if you can take one for a test drive. We tried that once with an airplane one, a military base, and they weren't very happy. Men with guns came along. It got bad for a while. You can't hack the TVM system. So the other option that we looked at as well is like, look, if I want my own little missile system, I'll just break into the control code. In other words, that from the ground station, the missile doesn't work pretty well encrypted. Now, back to the vectors. What can we get to? What can we easily influence? When we know we can get to the propulsion and the actual system itself, not much use. I can take over the propulsion system. I can rebuild it. I can find out what flaws are in it if I knew what the heck I was looking at, but it isn't going to help me. However, the nice thing about it is I can start messing around with the guidance chips. Those are really, really nice to play with. And the good thing about the guidance chips is the organization that makes the guidance chip systems is wonderful enough to go put it up onto the patent office. For those of you that don't know, the patent office is a really nice resource for intelligence gathering. A lot of organizations love to go, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. We put up some really cool patents. Great. Thanks, boys. We found them. <laughs> Top left-hand side. Very, very useful. Actually gave us some of the intel between, as you can see, the target position sensors, the guidance processes, et cetera, et cetera. This one's a really good one, the bottom left-hand side one, the autopilot model. What was kind of useful is we already taken out, oh, we've got a couple of other slides in here. We took out the autopilot system for the 787, and we're looking at this going, wow, they just borrowed some of the code. <laughs> Sweet. We own your missiles too. Imaging sensors, et cetera, et cetera. So at this point in time, we figured our target. We've figured the vector for the target. We've now got our data source for the target. Now we actually have to understand exactly how the hell do we communicate with the blasted thing? How do we actually influence it? And for this, bless his cotton socks. Well, actually, his name's on the bottom left-hand side. I thought I'd taken that off. Silly. Anyway, Walter. <laughs> Walter posted his resume online. Now, Walter, from everything I can gather, is a complete brainiac. Total call, literally a rocket scientist. Um, the nice thing about this one is you can see he's done an analysis of the Pac-3 MSG using P-Spice. Okay, let's do some Googling on that one. So the other Mac kept the design and implement. All of these acronyms, all of this stuff on here is very, very useful. The stuff that we picked up on was this part. Cordic algorithms. Anybody know what Cordic is? Good, neither did I for a while. It's a programming language that relies purely on math offsets for a nice way of putting it. We'll go into that in a second. The really nice thing about Cordic programming is it messes around with boards and gates. Obviously not Billy Boy. It actually works and doesn't blow up in midair. Now you start looking at this and you're like, okay, am I losing anybody here? Or is everybody like, okay, I get this. Everybody like, shit, what the hell is going on? Everybody good? Good. All right. I'm not getting down to code. I will not be putting code up there on how to actually modify guidance systems. I figured I'd get yelled at if I did that. <laughs> However, all this is publicly accessible. Um, the nice thing about some of the guidance chips and the guidance systems on these things is, again, 
the third party company that won the award and won the contract to actually build the communication systems quite happily and quite publicly put it up on their website. Now in this case, they actually took the, the screenshot I got on here is they do the entire interconnect system for the F-35. Like sweet. Now the really nice thing about these guys is if you get friendly with them, you can download the VXWorks testing harness. So now I've actually on, I think it's on this laptop, it might be on the other one, I've actually got the entire VXWorks testing harness for the F-35 right alongside the testing harness for a 787. It's kind of fun when I go flying nowadays. <laughs> like, look what I can do. Again, information disclosure, information overload. You know, we don't, again, we don't have to go out there and take the system down. You guys, the organizations behind here are happily giving us all the intelligence that we need to be able to go and do some research and some digging. Now, if we go back to this one for a second, again, top left-hand side on this one, Mac Panel Company has been awarded a contract to support the Pac-3 missile defense system. How many of your organizations you work for put this kind of data out there? How many of the companies go, woohoo, we've got a contract with Boeing, Raytheon, whoever the heck it might be, and here's what we're building for them. You've just painted a bloody great big target on your back. How many of your PR side of your companies and your organizations go out there and put this out of them? How many of you let your vendors do this? Control the data flow. This isn't even a DLP thing for crying out loud. This is just happily writing a PR thing and putting it out there. It's too down easy. So we'll go back to our little friends at MacPanel. Well, thankfully, MacPanel is really, really nice and wants to put on its public space the entire specifications um, for DOD communications within a missile architecture. Probably not something they should be putting up there, but it's very, very useful and gave us the entire architecture for how to build the blaster thing. So, we have our guidance system as our target. Our baseline architecture, we already have that. We know how we're doing it, we know what we're doing it. We know what the components we need to do. We know how the components work. We know how the components communicate. We also know the component methodology. All from public accessible systems. Now, what we've actually got to figure out is this rotational digital computing stuff. Again, uh, the simple way of looking at it is math offset. I end up downloading a bunch of code that our friend Walter had actually put out there. Modified that with some code I found, thankfully, on a flipping forum. Put the two together and figured out that the offset I needed to modify the missile guidance system Got the code sorted out. So, what have we learned from this so far? We know we can influence the component level. We have the manufacturers of the chipset. We have the manufacturers of the actual communication harness. We know exactly what code they're using. We know how they're using it. And by the way, that database that they had out there, we also know how to get into that database to download our own communication code on the, Co on the Cobic system. We obviously have no clue what the QA is on there. I don't know if I influence that system and that build process, whether my build is gonna get onto the missile or whether it's gonna get overwritten somewhere. The wonderful thing about, oh, somewhere in here, there we go. So the fill programmable gate arrays, FPGA. It's like an intelligent processor board. It's like a bloody great big smart sandwich. Yes? Was I what? <laughs> I did get the programming code for them, yes. <laughs> so yeah, good question. So actually the thing about the field, the program or gate arrays is they've different ones have got different types of code bases to them. So it, it's like a, it's an intelligent dip switch, should we say, for want a better way of looking at it. All different codes. So for the particular one that they installed on the Patriot system, yes, we actually have the code book for it. Very, very useful and completely perplexed the heck out of me for a while. I'm looking at this, it's like a dip switch setting. I'm like, what the heck am I doing with this thing? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, good question though. So yeah, we got it. So back to this part of it. Yeah, you know what, where are we? We know we've identified the language. We know we can actually modify the cordic code as well, partly through that system and partly through the communications, etc. We don't know if our modifications will take, however, Given the fact this was done with a small team of us, i.e. primarily me and a couple of my guys in some off time, we do know that there are probably some other organizations that would have way more fun doing this than we would if they've not already done it. 
Obviously, we've deployed PAC-3s out to Taiwan, much to the chagrins of China. I would imagine they would love to know how the hell to actually do some of this stuff. But who else have we annoyed recently? Well, we've annoyed the Middle East, the Far East, Africa, Europe, yeah, pretty much so everybody, not in blue. Again, you look at the target audience for this, you look at the target organizations, those organizations that want access to this stuff, time, motivation, and money. As you are red teaming organizations, or even if you're internal doing blue team on stuff like this, you have to do some research. You have to look at from the outside in. Chris hit it perfectly. You as a large organization are a target. Me as a small team, typically when we go out and do engagements, it's a two-man team thing. We will get in. And are we going to be able to get in because of the amount of intelligence you guys are putting out there? Or do we hit you guys directly or do we just come in via a third party? This is great. Melvin's misguided missile. I found it. It's online. You can, I was almost going to buy the bloody thing. Now, this was a good one. And maybe this can't be answered. It's a question I'd love to ask. If the USA made missiles and sold them to a third party country, and that third party country then somehow or other turned around and used them against the US, I wonder if there's any acquisition code in there that says, it's a US target. Bugger off, you're not blowing us up. I've always wondered that. There's like a little bit of embedded code in there somewhere that says can't be used against anything American. I've always wondered that. Anyway, so chances of walking on site and taking one for a test drive, not good. Again, too many people with guns. Chances of dealing with the suppliers, again, not good. They tend to ask awkward questions and they need lots of money. Chances of getting the technology from information spill, very, very, very good. While we're thinking about this, let's talk about tactical telemetry systems. These are fun. Again, squirrel moment for a minute. So we were messing around with airplanes, and we had fun with airplanes. Um, for some of you that saw the talk up in, I think it was Gurkhan, I talked very briefly about basically taking out uh, tactical telemetry. That nice little thing, I have one of those sitting on my desk at the moment now. It's really fun, and it's really good. You can adjust the telemetry of the guidance control systems for certain missiles. In theory, you can make them do that. <laughs> I just have to figure out how. <laughs> I really, really want to. Um, that was one of the Polaris sea launched ones that didn't go quite according to plan. Hence, sit, stay, walkies, play dead. Um, so that was missiles. Everybody good so far? Everybody's like, why the hell is this guy standing and hasn't had too much fun yet? All right. So we're going to spend a little bit of time same kind of concept, same kind of an idea. We're going to talk about aeroplanes. How many of you guys had to fly in here, by the way? Good. You'll have fun flying home now. <laughs> How many of you guys are local? Your bus system? It's fun. I made friends. What day are we on? Sunday, Saturday, last night. No, not last night. No, before last. When I made friends with the bus system. If you go down to the uh, bus depot with one of those nice little MiFi's, you can actually acquire their um, self-signed certificate, dump it onto the MiFi, rename the MiFi the same as the bus depot, go park yourself next to somewhere where they actually stop for like 5, 10, 15 minutes, fire up either the Cummings diesel or the Detroit with the electric system installed on it, make friends with the bus, and you can stop and stop the bus as it's going down the road. It's quite fun to do. How many buses did you do that to? wouldn't have a clue. Are we on camera? We are, aren't we? <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue. It's a theoretical thing. <laughs> so, now we've had fun with missiles for a minute. And again, as I said, I'm keeping this pretty high because I don't need to get yelled at too badly. Everything we're saying here is theoretical. Um, we'll have some fun with planes for a minute. So simple. All right. Setting the scene, mess around with planes, and then a couple of scenarios. We'll have a little bit of fun. So, same kind of idea. Top left hand side is Boeing's uh, electronic distribution system. We've got the Teledyne Road Star system on here. We've got this one. This was cool. I can't even reach. Look, the Intellibus system. Um, this was cool. We actually, about two years ago, we started messing around with cars, and we had fun with cars. And we managed, if you've got one of those nice modern cars where you walk up to it and it makes friends with your telephone and all this other good stuff, 
the Bluetooth architecture in there, you can bypass it. You can go to the main Autosar CAN bus network. You can mess around with the CAN bus network. You can disable ABS. You can accidentally set off the airbag. All these other good things. Well, as we were doing the research on this one, we started messing around with um, IntelliBus networks. Um, not IntelliBus. Um, who do we have we messed around with? We messed around with, yeah, the IntelliBus network, basically Boeing's own little system, and figured out that they weren't just using it in cars, they were using it in airplanes as well. So that gave us a little bit of intelligence, a little bit of fun to play with. So, again, back to our friends, the patent office. How does an airplane work was a good question that we really had no, well, we had a kind of had a clue, but we didn't really fully understand. So thankfully, the nice thing again about the patent office is every man, woman, child, or beast who wants to register a three or a four letter acronym for something on an airplane puts it all up in the patent office. So top left hand side helps the understanding of the communication. Second one down on the right hand side helps to understand exactly what the data type is. The internal IP address of the server on the Boeing 787 is still left in there, sorry. Um, and then you get down to the link layer and then the actual command and command resource layer. In other words, everything you need to know to be able to take out and start to communicate with said airplane. What does this mean in English? What are you targeting? Proper bloody Queen's English, none of this weird stuff. And it's a router, not a router, by the way. <laughs> Still can't. I've been here like 11, 12 years and I still argue about it. All right. What are you looking at? Bus master controller. In other words, target acquisition. You've acquired your target. Now you need to know what vectors you're going after. Particularly bus master controller and the network interface devices, or in this case, the IntelliBus modules. And then the SIM module as well. Basically, it's, it's an IBIM and a, it, it's a single module stacked for multiple modules. Go back to that. The stuff we were doing with the missiles, same kind of concept. Lots of things in a big sandwich. What are you going to need? Swiss Army Knife Toolkit. Again, that first one, research. All of us, it doesn't matter if you are red teaming against a bank, red teaming against a healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Research the blasted target before you go on site. No different than you do with this one. And don't just research the particular target. Look at the third party organizations. Look at everybody they talk to. Where do they have to send their data to be able to do work? Those are always nice vectors to go in against. No different than we did here. Healthy understanding of VX works. Um, very nice, very, very useful. Um, in fact, extremely useful. You will need it if you want to go after the autopilot system, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and a plane. Yeah, it's very useful to have one of those. If not, see if you can find one. Um, <laughs> I, we got access to a few. The sheriff jacket actually helped a little bit. Hi! Straight in. So you can't just walk, same as you can't walk up to a missile. They, they tend to get a little perturbed if you try walking up with a laptop saying, hi, can I make friends with it? Secondly, the Cat5 jack, it ain't going to work. There's a whole bunch of interface component ring that you need to worry about as well. There are two real decent vectors to get into your friendly airplane. Ground-based maintenance systems. The nice thing is when they sell you a 737, 77, or 787, they sell you like a whole toolkit. Really nice, it's like Snap-on on steroids. <laughs> and it's got the computer systems, and it's got the architecture and everything else. Now the nice thing about it is, is when they sell you the blasted airplane, they ask you what passwords you want. You say, I do not want the password. Do not password. Just give it to me. Let me use it. And they're like, no, you must have a password. And you're like, no, just let me use it. And they're like, okay. And they do. Really useful, especially when you're going up against the 747. There's no password on the ground communication systems. It's good. So again, your other vector is on board some of the airplanes. It's a little harder at that point in time. It's like breaking something while you're driving it. It could get messy. So what do we do? Again, thank you, Patent Office. How do we get it? Software maintenance tool connects to network. The nice thing about this is it's broken out behind the scenes here. Again, guys, do your own flipping research. I'm maybe pointing some general directions on this one. How does the tool work? How does the tool communicate? How do you download something onto a laptop? Or can you just go out maybe to the web and buy the necessary laptop that hooks up with it? Answer to that, yes, we have one. Cost, not a huge amount, especially if you get it on the used market. Very, very useful. The one thing where we started on the vector attack on this is we started looking outside of the continental United States. 
because the nice thing about it is, is they don't just keep 747s and 777s in this country. They ship them out of country. And out of country, they have maintenance systems as well. And those guys are a heck of a lot easier to influence than they are in this country. So again, research. Right at the beginning, I said something about It lists every single organization that builds specific aircraft. It lists it down to what component they're building. In this case, we actually had the instrumentation corporation. What assets, what basically electronic components these blaster things do. Top right hand side is the API that they use to call for the Intellibus network. Now you know what you're calling. Bottom left is obviously the DLL management environment. You can download the test environment for this blaster thing. You can write your own API calls into the main IntelliBus network and make friends with the components that are hooked into it. Again, all publicly accessible. And by the way, if you need to get down to the bottom level architecture, there it is. I, we had to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, tagging a 787. How does one tag a 787? Um, top right hand side is, is basically a, it's a TT Tech chip. It's a communication chip that we picked on. So we figured out exactly what architecture and exactly where we wanted to look at this stuff. We actually figured out that was the chipset we needed to do to get to the communication architecture to be able to influence the main, basically 787. Top left hand side, is the software we downloaded from their website to allow us to interface with their chip. This company, really nice company. They've got a manufacturing process somewhere over in Austria. They have an open FTP server that might happen to have some of the stuff on it. And it works Google, therefore it came into spec, not my fault. Now, when you have said chipset and you have said component, again, you can't just plug into the blasted airplane. Yes, you have to do a little bit more work. In the case of what we ended up doing down here, is you have to, you've got, basically got to make the container program. And it's called a crate. The nice thing about it is they've taken like WinZip and they've called it a crate and off you go. We ended up making our own, as you can see, loading inventory into crates, successfully loaded all our crates into the directory on the computer called 787 SMT parts. That was actually us interfacing with the 787. We made friends with one. We uploaded our own communication software, and our target was this thing. Nice little big thing, it's the engine management system. Basically, if we go back here, it's the full authority digital engine, the FADEC component. The nice thing about this is there are, yes, there's a couple of them. Thankfully, they've got failover on them. However, there's no manual override. So once you've influenced them, not just it, once you've told it the communication architecture, the variables you want it to attack, and the various influences you want to exert, when the damn thing's in the sky, there's no way they can manually override this thing. They're SOL. So, a couple of things we'll talk about on that one. The nice thing about the, yeah, everybody's like, shit, I'm not flying anymore. <laughs> your engine stop at 35,000 feet, give me a phone call. I'll send you the reboot code. <laughs> By the way, I was at, where was I? Da, not DerbyCon, this is DerbyCon for crying out loud. I was at a DEF CON, we were at B-Sides. And we figured out, and this was where it got a little annoying, because I, I, was, I was all happy about the fact we could fly the airplane along at 35,000 feet and stop the damn engines. And then some bright spark decided to weigh out the math, the math algorithm as to how far the thing would fall. Because you can actually reboot the engine on a 787. It takes about a minute to a minute and a half to restart engines and all this kind of stuff. We figured the thing would only fall about 9,000 feet. So then we looked at the algorithms for deploying the flaps, then turning the engines off. It falls a hell of a lot faster at that point in time. <laughs> I, I, it is what it is. No, this is not anywhere out there on any airplane that I know of anyway. Um, where are we? Helicopters. Come. Oh, have any of you guys gotten hold of those damn rubber duckies? You know the rubber duckies out there? I'm going to buy one. Because the nice thing about it is, the, the, you can see that's a helicopter. From, now, this does actually show the helicopter on the screen, doesn't it? It's really good. It's a bloody helicopter, for those of you who don't know. Um, this, these things actually annoy the hell out of me. Um, 
you guys who are either ex-mill or current or thereabouts, you know about all the problems with the Chinooks, the damn things keep landing awkwardly and killing people on board them? Yeah, you can blame the sodding FedEx systems for a bunch of that shit. Software issues with the engine management. We'll go into that in a little bit. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, smart card readers integrated onto the actual management console and the avionics. The nice thing about it is, is the newer version have also got USB drives. So if you figure out the exact componentry you want, you can take the little rubber ducky, jack the little rubber ducky in, then unjack the damn rubber ducky about, what, 15, 20, 30 seconds later, you just pwn the entire helicopter. <sighs> Everybody good so far? Everybody walking home this weekend? Good. <laughs> All right. So, some fun stuff we did on this one. I've somewhat deliberately obscured it, I have to admit, because I really don't want somebody seeing the actual code for one of the component systems that we had fun with. Um, this was where we were messing around. So again, it's, it's all available. If you know the system you're looking for, if you know the architecture you're looking for, um, you can download the particular, in this case, this is some of the VX, or inside the actual VXworks interface, we downloaded the component code for our little friend here, our little TTP chip here. We grabbed hold of the code for that thing because it was easily available and it was open. It was, the guys were happy to talk about exactly how they were working with Boeing and the 777, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the 787 as well with these guys. So we downloaded the component code and we explained to them we were doing some interface work and some interface design, and they gave us the entire harness for the damn thing. So, how does one go about dropping a plane from 35,000 feet? It isn't actually that hard, which is kind of scary. Well, it is kind of hard, but it wasn't that bad when we assist them. I still need somebody to let me test this out, by the way. So if any of you guys have got hooked into Boeing, just let me know. <sighs> The redundant system, again, no manual override. Do you guys remember about, was it 10, 15, probably more than that years ago when they were testing the Airbuses? It was like the, Air, the earlier Airbus. It took off from France and instead of going up in the air like this, the thing went, no, 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 you pull too far back on the stick and just plowed into the trees diagonally like this. A lot of that was because of this wonderful little system here, the authority engine control. The pilot and the co-pilot only have a certain amount of control, shall we say, within the actual airframe itself. In other words, if they yank it that way, the system's gonna say, heck no, you can't do that, and doesn't allow you to, which is great. Because it now means that there are variables in that you can recode. Now you would think, given some of this code, that the code would be relatively secure. You would think that maybe their SDLC would be in place a little bit better than those of us that are on the ground. The code we downloaded had documentation anomalies. The code had code comment, redundant code, aliasing the unstructured code in the FADEC system, and this goes back to our friends in the Chinook. So I basically dumped the entire Chinook code and had fun with it because I know some people in some of those things. Mismatched data types. Guys, this is basic coding errors. Heck, I really almost wanted to recode the bloody thing, give it a better title, and then send it back to them and say, hey, you might want to use this version rather than the versions you're using. Now, if I've got hold of the Chinook code, it isn't that hard to get hold of a bunch of the code for the trouble sevens, et cetera, et cetera. So, what can we do? Obviously, we can influence the FADEX system. That system is not just a self standalone system, it is influenced by digital controls engine management controls, engine systems, or the aileron architectures, or the attitude sensors, the pressure sensors, the speed sensors, all those other things. It's also influenced by analog systems. So if you decide you want to have a play with airplanes, you're going to have to mess around with analog systems and digital systems at the same time. You're going to have to understand how these things work. And part of the reason is we decided to mess around with the cornfield in Kansas, the CFIK syndrome. In other words, Jesse. Um, Jesse has been with me at a couple of other conferences. Um, tall guy. He's about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, wears overalls. You probably would have seen him creeping around at DEF CON. What we know on computers, he knows on engines. Absolute flipping genius when it comes to those things. In spite of our wonderful friendships, I decided I wanted to drop a couple of 787s on him, just because it was a good thing to do. Here, look, 787s. Actually, sorry, not 787s. Lots of airplanes. That's kind of what I wanted to do with his front lawn. So I figured out, how do you do this? Obviously, you've got to modify the autopilot configuration. In order to be able to do that, you have to influence, in this particular case, we went up to Rockwell's 
7700. Again, same thing. I'm not going after Boeing directly, I'm going after one of the components. How do I find the component? I do my research online. My research online tells me this is the organization that designs a lot of the componentry. This is the organization I need to be able to go after that controls the speed, the altitude, the flight path. Now, the nice thing about autopilot is there's a manual override. Autopilot doesn't do what it wants to do. Pilot goes flick and off goes autopilot. A couple of other things on that one. However, the nice thing about it on the 747-800s and some of the other ones, it's a manual switch. If you send the right signal code continuously to the manual override, you can disable the manual override, at which point in time you can't turn autopilot off. I like that. So we figured out exactly how to reroute a 747-800 from DIA, which is my neck of the woods, and have it basically fly a circle around Jesse's neck of the woods until it ran out of fuel. Um, the only problem is, in order to make lots of these things happen, I needed lots of airplanes. And we figured that probably the FAA would get annoyed with us if we started taking all of DIA's airplanes. So we decided to spread the love. So a bunch of those, a bunch of the airport lists that are there, we figured out what the targeting, what the coordination was, and how to actually get the damn things on autopilot. So we had some fun with it. So cornfield and Kansas syndrome. Unhappy Jesse syndrome. Now. Mr. Nickerson is a little bit more civilized than I am sometimes, and he suggested rather than us dumping an airplane out of the sky and causing a bit of a mess, that it would be more appropriate to do something like this. In other words, land the plane, but actually influence the passages in the back of the airplane. Influence in basically being inducing hypoxia by decompression sickness. Now, the nice thing about the 747, 787s, some of those, they can fly 40,000 feet or above they've been allowed to. But even if you say take a stand of 35,000 feet and you manage to basically get hold of a crap in pressure control system and do a manual dump and a rapid depressurization down to I think it's like three and a half, four thousand 4,000 feet, you do that twice in a row, theoretically, and I had to do a whole bunch of research on like medical science for this. I'm scared the living snot out of me. You can actually basically induce hypoxia. Now, the nice thing about being in the cabin pressure, the cabin, the co-pilot, and everything else have nice proper masks, and they get them on quickly. The downside about being in the cabin section is that doesn't necessarily happen, especially if I have already access to the damn system itself. The whole concept here is, if you look at it from a purely monetary standpoint, if you drop an airplane out of the sky, you're going to spend, what, a million dollars per person? Boeing, somebody's going to pay that out, maybe give or take a bit. If you land the blasted airplane and everybody in the back's dead or dying, that's an entirely different story. In theory, you would hope that the organization would listen. In practice, yeah, they still haven't quite listened yet. So, left a little bit of time for questions. Everybody's been kind of quiet so far. Any questions, guys? I kept it very, very, very high level. We've had a little bit of fun with it. Kind of. At least one from my side. Any questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, getting back to your, your coyote metaphor. Yes. Um, uh, there was a story a while back where instead of taking frontal approach as the coyote would take, yeah. um, there was a supply chain attack that basically happened to make every week or two. Right. Where they bought chip, uh, disguise chips. They were forced to make cat disguise chips. So yeah. Modified to be able to turn this off in flight. Yeah. Especially in the case of what we, and especially in the case of what we did. I mean, we go back a couple of slides just quickly. Sorry, guys, it's going to get kind of like ah, on the screen. Where is it? Where's our Womble that posted the bloody cut? Oh, I love him. Get a brain more ounce. He's so cute. Just want to give him a hug, don't you? I mean, yeah. To that point, if you are the guy doing the chip manufacturing, and one of your database guys. Why the heck should I go and attack your front door? Why don't I just go into, in that particular database in case, had a bunch of the ASICs and a bunch of the faded control stuff on it. I don't have to go beat you up on your front door. 
I don't have to, and again, the, Aust uh, the Austrian company that basically does the chipset for the 780s. They've got an FTP server for crying out loud that's got half the architecture on it, for goodness sakes. It's not that hard. And I'm going to attack it, I'll attack it from the side. But yeah, ex exactly. Um, the uh, Navy one, I wasn't aware of that one. So yeah, same kind of concept, same kind of an idea. Yeah. <laughs> That's good to know. I gotta look at this further. Yeah. Not heard that one. You can't easily turn one of the more modern jets upside down. If the airframe doesn't like it, it gets upset. At that point, the wings tend to do all sorts of weird things. I would imagine it'd be a, if a smaller one's possibly. I haven't seen it with the big jobs. Somebody said they did a barrel roll of a 747 over DIA, and I've yet to find that one in anywhere. I'm not taking questions from you, you scare me. <laughs> Yeah, um, where do we go to? So, if we go back, sorry guys, this is like going backwards and forwards like a yo-yo. I'm gonna get yelled at. Who's on next? Is I saw a white wandering around. Um, yeah, you go to this piece. So the bottom screen on there was purely attacking in from a maintenance system. So this was a grand control system, an organization that had been brought in to do maintenance and to do work on that particular attack vector. It was in a hangar, not well guided, not well looked after, not well, obviously not well flipping secured for crying out loud. But now you take that whole concept and you say, okay, let's go outside of the continental United States. Who is shipping their 747s outside of the United States to do maintenance work on them? Whose 747s, 787s, 777s are going outside of the United States to maybe go to the African continent or maybe to go to the Eastern continents to for just purely they're shipping over there, and then when they get over there, they have to do refuels and refits and everything else. That 747 fleet and 737 fleet, some of those are aging enough that they're finding their hands into other organizations where the maintenance crew is, you know, Giuseppe that just rides up in his blasted truck with the flipping laptop from Boeing or Airbus that's got no protections on it. I mean, at that point in time, I'll influence his system. I'll give him money if I have to to be able to gain access to that system and use it. All I have to be able to do is understand the componentry that I have to communicate with. I don't have to do much of that because it's all posted online for me. So yeah, from an attack vector standpoint, I go outside of our borders. It's easier, it's easier outside, you can do it inside our borders. You go outside of our borders, you'll get onto the system real fast, real simply. So yeah, good call, definitely. And then, well, actually, you, you sorry, you add another one onto that one, sorry. The other vector for attack on these things isn't just a ground control system. The other major vector for attack is inside the actual airplane itself. So if I'm doing cleaning on the airplane or I'm doing any kind of, maybe I'm putting more snacks on board the blasted airplane, between pilot changes, I'm allowed on board that airplane. When pilots aren't there, it doesn't take much to get into the control room, grab a version of a rubber ducky with an interface controller, jack into the system and hey presto, I've just downloaded my cray while the thing's sitting at DIA for crying out loud. Done deal. But yeah, good call. So are any of these interfaces exposed wirelessly on the uh, plane, or is, uh, do you use physical access? That's a very, very good question. Big hand, but not yet. Yeah, Pony Express with 3G just jacked into the cabin system. Um, I love this Pony. Yeah, I wish. No, in theory, if you look at the 787s, the architecture that in theory is in place, and I, again, you need access to one of these things for a long term, and there are teams out there that do the pen testing. To their credit, they have teams that do a bunch of this work. So I know from some of those, in the early days they put those things down, you were able to influence the firewall to be able to get to the main system, yada, yada, yada. They've nailed a shed load of that stuff down. So sitting on the plane influencing it, got it. Sitting on the plane influencing it and doing stuff like that, it, it, it ain't happening. Yeah. 
I mean, they've done enough now that they've segregated it from a security level that you're down here, you're gonna get up here, it, it ain't happening. Yet, let me influence that one. Yeah. Who knows, I mean, you do enough well, digging. Get the initial physical access later on and take over now. Well, that's the thing. I mean, again, go back to what we were saying there. If I can physically get into the system, is there any way for me to be able to basically leave the device there? The stupid thing is, why on earth would I want to be flying on the bloody thing, hacking into it? <laughs> hey, look, I got in. Oh, shh. <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> it ain't happening that easily. Alright, yeah. Say that, I say that bit again. That's why Nickerson actually, to, hit, to give him credit, that's why he turned and said, don't just drop the bloody thing out of the sky, land it with dead people on board. Because it shows more of a monetary <laughs> loss. The lawsuits ensuing from that are a heck of a lot more expensive than just dropping the blasted thing out of the sky. Honestly, from the other side of it, no I haven't. Purely because this is literally me and two of the guys sitting down in spare time messing around on whiteboards. Um, purely because we, you know, two year, two years, whatever it was ago, we messed around with the cars and from cars we went on to other things and we messed around with tractors. The stock one was tractors, I think, if memory serves me right. We basically figured out how to stop crop production. We messed on with that one. Um, and then we started messing around with this stuff. So this was us just literally going, okay, what can we do? I've got VX testing harnesses of the blasted um, in-flight control systems for three, of the organ for three of the flipping airplanes I've already talked about. You know, I basically have the entire autopilot system running on a running on a couple of VxWorks servers for two of the main seven systems, and I can sit there and I can go, okay, if I influence this component, what? Oh, okay, that's what it does. So I have the full testing harness, I have the full componentry system, literally from part time just messing around with this stuff. This is not my day job. My day job is basically breaking into systems. This is just pure fun, and. <laughs> It's kind of scary. As I said, you know, we do this for fun. You get a team or teams of organized individuals with time, motivation, and money. The day is out there, guys. All somebody's got to do is jigsaw the stuff together. No different than they have to do with your organizations, your companies, etc., etc., etc. I think we have time for one last question before I get yelled at. point because I mean some of the some of the component systems that we had I mean you, okay so the hell the flipping helicopter some of the exec helicopters that fly around New York wouldn't say much to mess around with those things either you look at the little jobbies that are on there and I think some of the components that we shot out earlier on on some of the interface components some of the researching components on there they basically taken some of the large-scale stuff in the 780s and scaled it down Rockwell has done it you look on Rockwell's site, they're like, hi, here's the 777, and by the way, here's the same stuff you can have in your Cessna, Learjet, Gulfstream, Camerajet, whatever. Yeah, you yeah, you start messing around with that layer of stuff, ah, that would be fun. And it's the same kind of architecture. And as you said, in some ways, it's not as well protected. 
it doesn't have the necessary, it doesn't always have the same number of redundant systems that you have to take out. Oh, man, hell of a lot simpler and cheaper. Easier and cheaper. Um, all right, any more questions? Who's on next? Where are they? Guys, thank you very much.